afternoon to everyone here in person at Raleigh Hall and those joining us online uh, for Marymount's Copenhagen Center for the Advancement of Women in Communications event on the power of the pen, women curating our own stories. After this satellite center was established on our campus almost one year ago, it's so exciting and rewarding to see it come to life today. Uh, thank you to our featured guests for bringing your knowledge and expertise to the table and sharing it with the Marymount community, Dr. Shadi Abdi, Kristen Hurrell, and Ayo Seke. I hope I pronounced your names correctly. We appreciate you being here. As some of you may know, the Lillian Lodge Copenhagen Center for the Advancement of Women in Communications is based at Florida International University, where I received my doctorate in electrical engineering. Uh, and I was there a faculty member for many years. Um, uh, I had the great joy of working with Dr. Copenhagen, who was a colleague and the dean of the School of Journal and Mass Communications at FIU. Uh, today, the Copenhagen Center is the premier national organization that is dedicated to diversity and equity for women communications. And early in 2022, it was announced that Marymount would be uh, the location for the organization's third satellite center. Uh, so we're delighted to join Rowan University in New Jersey and Stevens College in Missouri. With our capital location just a few miles from the center of DC, I see our satellite center in particular having great advantages in connecting our students with fulfilling career opportunities in communications. Uh, our center, as you all know, is led by Marymount's own Kim Meltzer and Melissa Harris. Uh, and together, all of us will empower female professionals and academics in all the fields of communications in order to develop visionaries and leaders who make a difference in their communities and professions. While also serving as a national thought leadership center on issues that impact women, across the different communication industries. Ever since our founding in 1950 by the women of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, Marymount has always placed a special emphasis on preparing women for the workplace and for the careers of tomorrow. This collaboration with the Lillian Lodge Copenhagen Center is just the latest example of how our institution is living out its mission every day and providing our saints with new pathways towards their future careers. Again, thank you all for coming and may this satellite center have a great success going forward. Sorry, I cannot stay for this great um, presentation. I'm sure it's gonna be phenomenal. I do believe in the power of the pen. Um, I am a, a published author, I've written many journals and, and books, and, and now have a monthly co column on leadership on Forbes. So um, uh, it's a, it's sometimes it's a little bit of a grind to make time for writing, as you know, because you're like, oh, I'm so tired, but it's important, uh, not only for those of you that are in your research tracks, but even uh, for me, I tend to uh, write my column based on current leadership challenges that I may be facing. And I find that people share that it, it's always a, a worthwhile read. So today, my nowadays, my, my writings are very short, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, it's not easy to write short, uh, short excerpts either, uh, you know. But uh, very important what you do. Congratulations. And enjoy today's presentation. Much success. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for putting us on your schedule. Um, Dr. They can hear me. Um, you all can hear me, right? 
Yes. Okay, good deal. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you making time to join us. And we know that if you could stay, you would. So thank you so much. Thank you, right. and have fun. Absolutely. So all moving right. on, I do want our dean, our dean is with us today. I do want her to just greet you all briefly uh, before we get started in our round table. Dean Niles Goins. Hey, uh, Dr. Harris, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Um, Dr. Harris uh, and I are both uh, communication uh, professionals. So uh, the Copenhagen Center has a little piece of my heart um, because my master's, bachelor's, master's and PhD are all in communication. So I wanna say hello to Carla. Thank you, nice seeing you from the Copenhagen Center. And, uh, and Kristen, who is one of our presenters, and I go way back. And so it's nice to see you, not at a conference, but in a, a setting like this. And thank you for coming to Marymount. Um, Shadi, I think is gonna be here at some point. Uh, she and I know each other well, and, uh, and so it'll be wonderful to see her and hear her. And Iro, I look forward to hearing the discussion um, from you as well. But I wanna say, just on a personal note um, that um, even as a university administrator, I recognize every single day the value of communication as a discipline, the value of um, communication from theory and praxis, especially uh, for women in the academy. And so I just want to say thank you to you, Dr. Harris, and uh, to Dr. Meltzer for putting this roundtable together. And I really look forward to hearing what you have to say from our speakers, as well as uh, thank you to, for representing the College of Sciences and Humanities. Congratulations to you all for, for putting on such a, a wonderfully uh, planned event. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. So having all of our introductions, so uh, Shadi should be joining us at some point, um, but we do have Dr. Harrell and Dr. Sakai with us here. Um, and so we're going to go on ahead and get started. So Dr. Sakai and I are sharing. So I'm not a technology person. I'm a communicator. Um, <laughs> and the IT people know me well because I call them often. And so today I've been running my own IT and Dr. Meltzer came in and saved the day somewhat. So uh, Dr. Sakai and I are sharing the same screen here. Um, so, I'm and, <laughs> and thank you so much. And I do not mind sharing, considering that we both graduated from Howard University. Um, so sharing is part of the family <laughs> and the vision and the mission. So thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you so much to Merriman College. The students that I've met so far have been amazing. My escort to the to the building was amazing. Meeting the president of um of the communications uh, honors college was amazing. So and all of you here, I am really grateful that you're here. Thank you so much for attending and listening in with us. Um, again, my name is Dr. Ayo Sakai. I am the CEO and founder of a social science academic publishing company. It's a global international social science publishing company where we publish scholars, black scholars, uh, and reinventing and teaching scholarship from an Afrocentric and black perspective, perspective especially from theory and practice perspective. I'm also a Fulbright scholar, I'm an activist, I'm also a published author, writer. So like your president said, the power of the pen is important um, and especially for women. So thank you for having me and I'm excited to be here. Great. Uh, Dr. Harrell, would you please introduce yourself? Happily, yes. So, and, and first let me say um, to both Marnell Niles Goins um, and especially to Melissa Harris, thank you for inviting me to speak with you and be here with you today. I appreciate both the warm welcome and the invitation very much. So yes, uh, my name is Kristen Hurl. I am a professor at, I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, where my specialization is in the area of rhetoric and public culture, but more specifically, much of my research has explored um, media, entertainment, television, cultures, representations of activists um, and activist women. Um, and so I've, I've written about portrayals of the 1960s in popular culture um, and, and the kind of um, warped perception that we're all introduced to through media portrayals of flaky, hippie women. Um, and um, but I think for our purposes here today, um, part of my expertise also is as the former editor of Women's Studies in Communication, which is the sort of leading quarterly 
a feminist journal for communication studies, as several of you um, have also been involved in that journal and are aware. Um, but it was it was the first journal to um, make feminism part of active meaningful scholarship in the field. And so I'm happy to speak with you about my experience there as well. Great, thank you. So I have a few, the way that our roundtable is gonna to work today, I have a few starter questions that will get us started, um, but you all are welcome to ask questions, all of our participants. You can go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Uh, Dr. Meltzer is monitoring the chat and will let us know when you have a question, as well as those of you that join us here in the room, you are welcome to have a question. If you have questions, please write them down at the question and answer period. We would be glad to answer that, okay? We've got a little more time because instead of three speakers at this point, We've got two, so uh, they can split that time a little bit. All right, so our first question is, um, you already did the introductions and told us a little bit about yourself. So let's move into, why is it important for women to curate our own experiences and narratives? And so whoever would like to go first can go first. It doesn't matter to me. So Dr. Sakai, since you're next to me, <laughs> I'm going to draft you to go first. No, nope. that was kind of worth to see if I needed to send out for her. We're working on technology so Dr. Sakai can be on the large screen, but just bear with us so we can keep rolling. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, you know, as we know that girls run the world, you know, so, I mean, that alone, just by virtue of its importance that women exist are important. And I believe that women have been the true leaders in activism of change, the curators of history, just in general. So it is very important for women to, um, to tell our stories and curate that narrative. Um, but from, a, from a, a political science perspective, I'm a political science by nature. When I graduated from Howard University with my PhD it was in political science, black politics and international relations. And as an immigrant, I tend to focus more towards that realm. So I'm gonna gear my conversation in that regard because I think it's important to look at not just women in general, but the, the role that black women have played historically um, in the role of you know, curating history and holding the narrative of, um, of, of what we do with the, with the pen, with telling stories. So can I go? Because you sit right here because you're big now. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Uh, so, you know, it's so interesting. One of the first thing as a published, as a publisher of Black books and Black scholars, you know, it is very, one of the things that lead me and guide me in that initiative is one of the things that we're focusing right now a lot, which is on the banning of Black books, the black banning of historical narrative, rewriting history. And we do know that women, you know, especially, I saw Tony, I was having a conversation recently with my executive advisor, and she was reminding me that Phyllis Wheatley was the first published author, a Black woman who was then enslaved, who learned to write, and she published her first, she was like about 16 years old. And historically, you know, we take pictures, we tell stories, and it is by virtue of that that we now have the information that we have to, to empower us and to keep moving. Uh, you know, the feminist movement, the Black feminist movement, all of that is by virtue of women seeing a dysfunction, something missing historically, and taking the helm to move forward and to change that history. So why is it important for us to own our narrative? It doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what you do. It is important that your story is authentic. It is important that your story be told. And it is important that despite what demographic, what race, culture, creed that you're in, that you are allied with those who are less fortunate. Telling the story and living um, authentically the truth of who we are is really important to the historical legacy and everything that we leave in the future. So it's absolutely important to tell stories. It's important to write and, and to um, publish mm -hmm. um, and to and theory and practice, like our dean said, you know, is very important in setting the foundation of everything that we do for the future. Absolutely, great. Okay, so Dr. Worrell, I'm gonna have you answer. And then Dr. Abby has joined us. So I'm gonna, I'll let you do both your questions, your introduction and answer question, this question at the same time after Dr. Worrell. So go ahead, uh, Kristen, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, so- uh -oh. uh, can't hear her. Oh, because I hold on one second. I, I've got to mute myself here so we can unmute you there. 
And then, so just unmute that outer. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Thank you. So to add on to um, the previous comments, um, the other uh, reason is that um, if we don't tell stories about ourselves, someone will tell stories about us. And they will be, they will be less flattering. Um, from a media studies perspective, um, you know, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by the trenchant misogyny that still persists and racism throughout media and public culture, even though there are more feminist stories and narratives out there, um, they're constantly countering other more misogynist stories told as a um, memorable, perhaps body example. I, I watch a lot of television and I study a lot of television and I've noticed that a common trope that appears as a way of introducing women characters to a story to introduce if a character is a little rebellious is that she often in the first episode of a series has anonymous sex with a man against a brick wall behind a dumpster. I've seen this in like seven different TV series. Mm -hmm. um, these are not stories that women tell. I, from my experience, I have yet to, to know a person who enjoys <laughs> having anonymous sex against a brick wall behind a dumpster. But these are often stories that media culture tells about women, particularly when men are behind the scenes writing and crafting their stories. Um, for women's studies and communication, too, that, that journal emerged, um, I think the first issue came out in 1974, by a group of feminist scholars who noted that the predominant scholarship, the predominant journals in communication studies were writing about and for kind of privileged men in the discipline, men who, um, by one account I've heard, told um, a leading woman scholar that not the reason there is no scholarship about women is that women had never produced anything worthy of analysis. So, right, misogynist stories are frequently told about women that must be countered and elsewhere, um, there are no stories about women. So writing, writing our stories becomes an imperative and supporting those stories does as well. Thank you. All right, so Dr. Abby, if you would just briefly introduce yourself, we'll go on ahead and tackle that question. Why is it important for women to curate our own experiences and narratives? Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry uh, about uh, being a little late. I had the worst technical issue and then I had to get IT here. So luckily it got fixed. Uh, I really appreciate um, making the space here. My name is Shadi Abdi. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at San Francisco State University uh, in the Department of Communication Studies. Uh, and my work is largely about um, culture and family and writing and, and narrative writing specifically. Um, and not just my own narrative, which I, I have uh, written uh, extensively my, my own narrative, but I've also really um, spent my career uh, honoring the narratives of women of color uh, and hearing their stories and really making sure that um, the stories of, of women of color, specifically my, my research looks at queer Iranian American uh, women uh, and making sure I'm honoring their narratives. And so uh, much of my work has been centered around of kind of letting people tell their stories for themselves, right? Um, and it's something that I never had growing up. I never got to read a story really like my own. I never got to... Um, I really felt isolated in the way that I experienced um, life and as a uh, as a queer woman of color growing up in the US with a very Iranian family, uh, that conversation never came up. And so I felt very um, lonely for most of my 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 life, really. Um, and, you know, I went to uh, undergraduate uh, college at, at uh, Cal State Long Beach in California. Um, and it was there that I started, I really got into kind of performance studies uh, in a way that I never thought that that would be of interest to me. Um, and uh, I, I pursued my master's degree and it's there where I wrote my first um, autoethnography. Uh, and that was after reading people's stories that were close, but I, I really felt like no, nobody had told my story in, in some way, right? I really didn't feel connection. 
Uh, and then when I went to my uh, PhD program at the University of Denver, that's where I first got introduced to um, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and, um, you know, uh, I got, I read A Bridge Called My Back um, and uh, with, with uh, uh, Ansel Dua and Moraga, right? And so it was not until I had re really Sister Outsider with Audre Lorde really was one of the, the books that changed my life because it was such a similar experience about being from a community that really didn't understand you, um, but also that family connection, which is like not separable. Um, and it wasn't until my PhD that I got to read those stories and I really felt a connection. And that's when I realized, right, women's stories um, are, are able to, to change lives, uh, to just be able to have that connection in some way. Um, I felt so connected to, to those experiences and it really was eye-opening for me. Um, and that's why I kind of have spent my life really honoring women's stories. Um, whatever they look like, right? They're messy, they're fun, they're hard, they're challenging in a lot of ways. Um, for, for in the context of, of queer Iranian American women specifically, um, it, it, it's, it also can be very dangerous. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I talked about early on in my career was narrative trespass, this idea that you can uh, tell stories where you're never supposed to tell stories or tell the stories you're not allowed to tell, right? Uh, to trespass into those spaces. And um, that's really kind of the, the ethic with which I, I pursue those, those, those conversations. And like Kristen, I watch a lot of TV. Um, and actually, if anybody was, has been familiar with the new iteration of the L word, Generation Q, um, it's okay. Uh, but they had this, um, this queer Iranian uh, couple for the, and I, it was this, uh, I, I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This is a story. Obviously somebody has experienced this conversation and, and this is the story. And then they broke them up and it was a horrible situation. But that even that that story began to be told um, made me really believe in this idea that really kind of those stories transcend, those narratives transcend. And, and you see that a lot in television and um, they're exciting. And I'm excited to, to continue to, to be in a space where women tell stories. So thank you so much. Great. We kind of hit on this a little bit in that first question. Um, when Dr. Sakai is ready to answer, we'll switch it over so you can see her. Um, in your experience, what are some of the challenges women face in publishing, particularly within academic settings and mainstream publishing? What are some of the challenges? And whoever would like to go first can jump in. Maybe we'll start this time with you, uh, Kristen. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, you got that. So, no, excellent question. I think there's some internal and external challenges, and I, I can name many. So the first two that came to my mind, ex like for external challenging, I think, um, in, uh, and I'll speak about academic publishing, um, is finding the outlets open to trespass. Right? Finding those spaces where editors and journals are committed to innovation, to being challenged, to supporting work that challenges even the norms that have been established within those journals and defining the people who are willing to um, champion and work with pieces that challenge their own assumptions. Um, and finding mentors, I think, who can support you to guide along that way. Um, and I think there's some internal challenges I know. And a lot of this is driven from my own experience, just working with graduate students who are just learning about the publication and writing process is that, um, and I hope this isn't over generalizing, but I know often that um, women students and scholars of color are often prone to seeking perfection in their writing, probably because the stakes, right, right like that, um, they, their work is often more scrutinized, right? So they're prone to perfectionism. And so they want to make sure a piece is perfect before they send it out, right? And that they're anticipating all the resistance and pushback often, which makes it harder to send it out. So it stays on their desks. Whereas many of the 
white men scholars I know are like, I have an idea, I'm gonna write that up. And they write it out quickly and it, it gets scrutinized, um, but often it goes, it goes through the process more quickly because, I don't know, I, I'm not, I, I shouldn't psychoanalyze my students, but to note that I think perfectionism is a driver um, that often makes it harder to publish and get women's stories told. And so, so I think overcoming that by finding people who will support risk-taking is a really important element of the publication process. Dr. Abdi? Yeah, I think I, I absolutely agree with Krista. And I think finding the outlets are, are really um, imperative, specifically with narrative writing or, or uh, writing stories. Um, it, I, I really wish this wasn't the case, but I do feel like some folks still find barriers in that. Like, how do you how do you make sense of uh, narrative writing and 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 research? And it's very I mean, it's not that complicated, right? Stories uh, are uh are embodied theories right stories are embodied our embodied experiences are theoretical um and so it is they're they're two hands i don't know what the saying is two two sides of the same coin right um and really i think what's what's i think that is the biggest challenge is really having to make an argument for or work that includes storytelling or narratives, um, which I find to be very problematic in and of itself, right? I, I The publication venue has to be open to it. And it all depends on who is the editor, who is who are the editors that they're sending it to, who values specific research. And, and again, those are things that I think um, hopefully are changing, but I, I, I do see that as the biggest barrier um specifically thinking about where um varying publications go so when i look at for instance um uh calm journals for nca i i i, I look at the ones that i know will will probably be open to it um and i know most people don't have that that feeling they go for whatever journal or whatever publication venue is closest to their research. So Journal of Family Com, for instance, uh, I write a lot about families um, and I have fat and pushback on, uh, on, on narrative work, right? Um, unless it's kind of really intermixed with, with some different uh, uh, methodological perspectives. But at the same time, I think the more that uh, writing, narrative writing is presented to those spaces, the more they, they take it uh, to, to help. So I think, you know, that, that, is a, that is a big barrier. I also think with my students, it's very, the, the most challenging lesson that I teach them is that it's okay to use the word I, right? Uh, it's unlearning, <laughs> it's unlearning so much uh, uh, prior learning about uh, not using the word I, not centering yourself, not centering the voices of those around you and um, really telling them it's okay, you can do it um, and you should do it. And even in your academic papers, you can be reflexive, right? Um, and I think it's that unlearning that that is also a challenge. But once I, I find that once people uh, do it for the first time or once people are exposed to reading academic articles that have narratives in them, they begin to see uh, really how powerful it can be. Most of this, most of my students have the most genuine reaction when they read um, works with narrative in them because they connect to them in some ways. So I think exposure is really the way around that, but that goes for those bigger uh, hurdles as well. Awesome. And then I'm going to go to Dr. Sakai, Io. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. And um, I cannot agree more with both what you what you both stated because um, these are very very important comments and um, I I hope I'm not going to make this a little too heavy because I want to be authentic in this conversation um, especially bringing it from a black perspective as an, an immigrant and as a PhD from an HBCU um, in political scientist uh, science and black politics um, so. Publishing is difficult for women for a lot of ways, especially if you're talking about pen and track. 
right? I am really excited that one of the books that we have that Universal Right Publications um, have coming out soon will be a book by Dr. Crystal uh, Chambers on women leadership in the academy. And just some of the challenges that we face trying to matriculate in any environment. Our voices are often muted. And then of course, if you're LGBTQ, if you're black, if you're, you're any other demographic, then you're more um, suppressed uh, you know, for lack of a better word. So this is um, a very important conversation in that way. Um, I think black scholars tend to be even more muted when it comes to being published. Um, men, like, like it was stated before, typically just come up with an idea and they can go out and people will listen to them. They're not as scrutinized, they're not as um, subjugated to what society say. They, are, they do not feel the same type of marginalization and censorship that we feel. And then when you talk about Black women or Black scholars, it gets even more difficult and challenging because we suffer then not just from being women, but then also from being all the other um, you know, spaces that we live in, right? And all the other hats that we wear. So now we suffer from imposter syndrome and we think we're not good enough and we work 10 times as hard. So even as you know, women in general are marginalized, when it comes to black women, it's even more so. So our voices are oftentimes muted and then trying to matriculate, especially in the academy is even more difficult. So we find ourselves trying to write uh, works that would be more acceptable to publishers, to journals. Um, we, we try to use the words and the tone and the language that um, others find appealing or palpable. Um, and we are not authentic in expressing ourselves and being true, genuinely true to our own voice and our own narratives and what we truly believe will be impactful in society. So I believe that um, in order to, to publish, even myself as a publisher, my company has been around for almost 20 years, but it wasn't until I met Malefic, Dr. Malefica Tiasante, who became my mentor, the father of Afrocentricity, who really guided me in focusing on publishing social science books. And then partnering recently with Sage Publishing, who is an amazing ally, you know, who said and believe in setting the tone and the foundation for being authentic and telling the truth, you know, curating our own knowledge, telling our own story. The very motto of UWP, Universal Right Publications, is that we will tell our own stories. And that is so important because as Dr. Abdi noted earlier, you know, that, that trespassing, that narrative trespassing, you know, go hand in hand with co cooperation with knowledge. White men and men in general tend to be able to feel comfortable going into spaces that they should never be. You know, they tell us, you, you mentioned, um, Kristen, about, you know, the story about television. You know, women wearing thongs and high heel shoes and running into danger and being the damsel of distress. Not that we want to mute our femininity, but we also want to have our agency, that we are strong. Yes, we are strong. We do not want to own this whole strong woman, you know, trope that has been thrown around so much that take away the ability for us to be vulnerable. But we do want to be recognized for our agency that we do have stories and that our voices are strong and that we have a message that we can share. And that is the, the, the danger that we have right now with the banning of not just black books, but LGBTQ, um, you know, and all the other, you know, um, spaces that are being muted if you're not talking about, you know, um, the Greeks and the Romans and starting your historical stories from Plato and Aristotle. You know, how dare us, you know, talk about women who have achieved, you know, historically for so, you know, for so many, so long and have set the tone for so many of us. How dare us start our narrative before 1619? How dare us say that there was a lived experience of black people prior to the enslavement, the historical enslavement that we also know so much about, right? And that is that consistent muting you know, of our voices, of women's voices, of our tones and our essence and everything that we believe in. So it is important that we find publishers 
to co-sign with what both of my, my fellow speakers said, who are allies. It is important that we find spaces that where our voices are celebrated. And it is important that we publish, you know, in places where we're not censored and to find ways to do that, despite, you know, the, the rigor and the challenges that we will face to do so. I see a hand, Dr. Niles Goins has a hand. I would just say Go this. Um, and um, Go for it. Okay, and I, sorry, I, you know, when I saw your picture. Hold on one second, Dean. Okay. Now you can go. I would. I also want to say I want to apologize to Io because I said we hadn't met, but we have met. I think twice. Once, twice at, at Howard. Um, but I want to say um, I really love this discussion. I have two different thoughts and or questions. Um, and the first is you said Io, we should go to spaces that don't mute us. And I'm saying this as a black woman with immigrant parents uh, from the Caribbean. Um, I would also add to that and actually maybe challenge not just the speakers, but to those who are listening to create those spaces as well. Um, I am first vice president for the National Communication Association. And just hearing the conversations that we have about publishing and putting uh, and finding editors for journals like uh, Dr. Hurl has done in the past with women's studies and communication. Um, it also depends on who is selected as the editor and who's selected as, the, as a member of the editorial board. Um, and so we're thinking about it as, as almost as if we are susceptible to what these boards decide, and in a way we are. But at some point, we've got to go and you know be in editorial positions, get editorial boards that are reflective of the types of works that we want in there, and create the spaces for what we want to see and hear, and the type of culture that we want in that journal. On the other thing, and so I want to tie in what I'm hearing from all three of you. Um, and I'm wondering if you can help me come up with, I'm gonna put solution in quotation marks um, because uh, Dr. Hurl, you mentioned that when um, white men like put forward articles, sometimes it's just an idea, right? And the confidence often helps with the movement forward to publication. And then um, Ayo and Shadi, you know, you know what it's like to have immigrant families. We are perfectionists, right? This is not gonna go anywhere. You know, nobody's gonna see this until it's done. Um, is the solution to try to let go of that perfection and just, just, you know, act and behave in a way that may be outside of our own natural feeling of what is perfection? Is that a potential solution or is that just a no-go? Because if it is, and I have some ideas that I need to start submitting to journals right now. I want to, I, if you don't mind, oh, if you don't mind, I want to, I want to jump on that, um, yeah, you know, so you made some excellent points, right? Because we have to peel behind the curtains. I want to address that first. What you noted about who's behind the selection processes, right? Which is another great thing about Universal Right Publications, because even though I've partnered with Sage Publishing, they have given, of course, com you know, I have complete um, autonomy in selecting the voices that are making the choices, right? So if you go to a journal, you want to know who's the ones that are sending you back your reviews and saying, you know what, you need to pipe this down a little bit. You're making us look bad. The people who are saying, you know, you want to shift this narrative a little bit. You know, this doesn't sound good. You want to know who are the people making the selection, the people who are saying, yes, I love this storyline, the people who are saying, yes, your voice is authentic and we value it, we see you and we hear you. Right, so that's an excellent point, and I'm really, really glad you brought that up, Dr. Niles. Um, and then to your other question about, you know, should we just kind of get rid of this whole um, perfectionist thing? As someone who was born and raised in Jamaica, <laughs> you know, we are never, as immigrants, as um, marginalized communities, we are never going to stop feeling like we have to be perfectionists, especially as women, right? We wear many hats. We're mothers, we're sisters, we're daughters, we're friends. You know, that is just the very foundation of who we are. So I believe that we should be perfectionist and publish despite it. I think we should keep our high, our high energy, our high belief and integrity, our high focus on the, on the quality of the work that we put out not using the word rigor as another form of, you know, marginalization and subjugation, but rigor to enhance ourselves. And we need to publish and push past all of that, this 
despite our um, our perfectionism, despite our feelings of um, imposter syndrome, because I think you know there there are different types of anxiety, right? You know, every time you go to speak, every time you perform, every time you go before a class, every time you do something new, that butterfly is like that, that feeling of anxiety and anxiousness that maybe you're going to fail or maybe you're not going to do so good. You know, but usually that's those same butterflies, that those same anxiety are what makes us great. You know, the things that we push way beyond and we feel so awesome when we've accomplished it and we go, oh my goodness, we've done it. And then our sister circles and our and our sister friends and our, our allies all rally around us and said, yes, you're doing good. You're seen, you're, you're visible, you're heard. That's what we need to continue to do. So yes, Dr. Niles, push out those journals. Let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Shadi, did you want to um, answer that as well? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, perfection is uh sometimes one of our biggest uh hurdles that we face i i I know i certainly i feel the same way um as dr it's just really hard to send something out that you don't think is like a hundred percent and then i i I go back to you know what dr hall's saying it's you see sometimes you read things and you're like how did this make it through this conversation or why is this person writing about this whereas like you know, you're not seeing specific uh, voices. And, and then I, I think about exactly like, you know, why, why are, why are there not as many people that, that look like us in those positions uh, as editors or as in the editing board? And it's, again, those editors are choosing who they, who they really want to be a part of that conversation, which then again, matriculates into a couple of years of the same thing over and over. Um, and I think that's important. I think that, that you know, I'm really impressed by by that publishing uh, uh, autonomy. I think that's an amazing uh, way to to really make space. I, Dr. Goins being uh, you know first VP of NCA, really changing what the the demographic of NCA looks like, the leadership of NCA looks like forever. I hope um, you know when you look back and you look at uh, past presidents. I mean, it's recently changing. It's nice to see kind of folks uh, really take space. But before that, I I didn't see anything like that, right? And so even just hearing somebody who has a position uh, like uh, first VP of NCA say, like, we need more people in these these places. um, I think that's the most important thing is to see folks uh, to make uh, space. And even, um, you know, Dr. Armand Towns uh, with the new journal of, of Journal of Race, I think it is, Journal of Race and Communication, um, very specifically centered on race, right? We already have a culture journal uh, and that's not what he wanted to do. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky to be his friend and, and knowing what he really wanted to, to do with this, um, with this new academic void, Journal of Communication Race, yeah. Really the, the goal of that, to center people who, who haven't been centered. And I'm so, uh, I admire that so much. And I, I, I think that those are really how we make inroads. Um, and, you know, I also hope that more people kind of submit to spaces where otherwise you don't see a lot of that, that uh, those voices being amplified. And so, um, oh my God, it's saying that it's going to update my computer and restart it. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, sorry. Uh, but you know, that's something, and I'm still a young academic. I still am a junior scholar. And so those spaces really, for me, are lifelines more than anything else. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of I was lucky to have a lot of mentorship in my PhD program. I had uh, Bernadette Califel was my advisor and uh, having a woman of color really be my champion uh, throughout that process uh, changed the entire conversation for me. It really gave me space to say my voice is valid and my stories are important. The stories that I'm sharing are important. Um, And before that, I didn't really have that. And I think that's also something to be said about mentorship and having mentors really guide you um, into to where you should be, where your voice should be, how, how to really navigate those spaces. Um, and I'm grateful for that because I really do think I, I was made to believe that I could do things that, that 
were more challenging uh, than I otherwise thought. And, and I think that that belief system being instilled in me um, made me want to push through those those conversations. So I absolutely think people, more people need to be in positions where they get to make these decisions and make space. And we need these publishers. We need people in, in with autonomy saying, no, these are the voices that we're going to amplify. Um, and, uh, you know, I think all of those things together hopefully are going to make changes. And I'm really excited to see where this journal goes. I'm excited to see what the first issue is going to look like. Um, so, yeah, I think that's where I'm at with that. Thanks so much, Dr. Abby. Um, it made some great points. Like I totally understand mentorship. I think that's important. When we're talking about women curating our own stories. It's working within that system that we have, right? And that whole each one reach one and pull the other up kind of uh, thing. So I have to shout out even my mentors who have come before. And like, so if it wasn't for Dean, I was going to when I was a undergraduate student who kind of saw me as a student in my undergrad and like, what are you doing? She just asked me, what are you doing? <laughs> like <laughs> X, Y, and Z. And so she ended up mentoring me all the way through my uh, master's thesis and sent me to Howard to do my PhD and then constantly told me how important the story that I was telling was. And so we all have different bedside manners. So some of us need, you know, that kick in the pants that you can cry right now, but get over it and get back on the horse, right? So never letting you sue because there are tears, there's frustration, there's anger when you're trying to, to build bridges and kick in doors and take, make your own seat at a table, right? Build your own table because we're not getting seats there. So sometimes we have to make our own. So definitely inspired by our dean and now having our second vice president, again, another black woman coming up the ranks with NCA. So I agree, Dr. Abby, as a junior scholar, seeing the face of NCA change from older white men to the mix of what the world really looks like is really, really motivating. And I appreciate to Dr. Hurl because when she was the editor for the Journal of Women in Communication for Western States Communication Association, again, taking the helm and helping us tell and curate our own stories, right? So I'm an activist in my heart. Dr. Hurl is actually coming in to my activism and media class I'm gonna share with my students this semester. So that brings me to my other question. And I wanna encourage anyone, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat because this is the one question I want to make sure that I got to, um, and then we'll open it up, and if there's questions in the room, we'll take. So all three of you engage in activist works and, and, and activist frameworks in, in different ways through your scholarship. How have you been able to further your own activist agenda through your writing and your publishing? Um, go ahead, Dr. Hurl. Actually, can I, would it be okay for me to also answer Martinelle's question? Sure. First, real quick, sure. um, because I, I wanted to bring up two things I think are really important too. First, the, the conversation about the work that needs to be done behind the scenes to, um, to also have in place mentors and editors and journal reviewers who are open to this work. And what we haven't talked about um, is also the kind of labor conditions under which that happens. One of the bigger challenges for me as an editor was that um, so much of the work of editing and reviewing is kind of free labor, right? where like my institution um, and most institutions don't regard journal editing as a form of academic contribution. They only count one's own publications, right? So journal editing is service, right? Um, even though it takes up most of an editor's time in that period. Um, and for reviewing, too, to be a really thoughtful editor or reviewer of a journal article, you have to spend time um, in kind of working, right, reading within the grain of what, a, what someone is doing. And I find that everybody is pressed for a lot of time, particularly um, underrepresented groups, right? Women of color in the academy by all the data I've read, are tasked with more service, with, with, um, um, with um, like often a heavier mentoring load. And I think there are particular challenges with, like, um, with doing this kind of work, right? That I would love to see broader structural transformations that value the work people do mentoring and serving and supporting earlier career scholars in the field. And so I think this also, if I have to talk about what we need for women to tell their own stories, we need structures that value um, the work that's 
that needs to be done to publish the telling of those stories in new ways. Um, in terms of the question about perfectionism, um, maybe I make a distinction between doing great work, doing excellent work, and doing perfect work, because I think that the idea of perfection for many of the students I work with um, uh, is an impossible standard. We will, we will make a mistake when we publish something, or we will have thoughts that develop and change and what we wrote previously may evolve. But the structure of the academy is that we have to publish often to sustain our careers. So I would encourage students to do great work, strive for excellent work, but not hold themselves to an impossible standard that um, white men in the field haven't held themselves to as they're thriving. All right, so I'm interested to hear other people's stories about activism. I think I introduced my scholarship about activism, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cede space to my other presenters. All right, uh, Dr. Abby or Dr. Sakai. Okay, uh, so oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. okay, this is a great question about activism, and I think it's really important. And I think the points made are very important. Um, you know, especially that one point about Black women being given more service work, especially with the onset of DEI that we know is failing. Um, so they usually tell Black women more to do DEI work and other work in addition to what they're doing. And it is publisher perish. So if you're not, if you're doing all of this activism work and you're doing all of this CDI work and you're doing all of this service to the academy, you can't get published. And if you can't get published, you can't get tenure, right? Additionally, we know that black scholars are published, you know, far less, about 80% less than white scholars in the academy. And so, you know, of course, again, you can't get a grant if you're not published. You cannot get tenure if you're not published. You cannot get a job if you're not published. You, you, I mean, your your career really is at a dead end if you're not published. So I believe my activism work is the fact that I've always loved reading and writing and publishing. Um, you know, I started publishing fiction and poetry, yeah, and as a poet and a scholar. So my activism work, I really believe as a CEO and founder of a black publishing company, you know, publishing great scholars like Melissa Cantillascante and on our board are black scholars. You know, we even down to the very font that we use, we look for black creators of fonts to use for our, our, our books and our texts. We look for black scholars to be reviewers and editors. In, uh, in with, un with universal right publications. So I believe that this is a form of activism and in the social movement of black books of, of banning critical race theory, we know that in Florida right now, they have completely banned African-American studies as a form of, you know, of real educational research. Um, I believe at this moment in time, just by virtue of a universal right publication existing since 2000, for just by virtue of Sage Publishing helping to make this company an international company, that the books are marketed and diverse and, and available everywhere across borders into Africa because we know that scholars are everywhere. And even if you're not published here in the United States, you're not even considered, you know, a scholar who's worth talking about or worth listening to. So by very nature of me sitting here today, I believe that this is my biggest activism to date. You know, towing the line to push forward and publishing black scholars, and you know, from an Afrocentric and Afro African-centered point of view. Because uh, one of the biggest problems that we're facing is that not only do we have to be published in the publisher parish um, concept, concept, you know, you have to be published um, and you're talking about being published from a Eurocentric perspective. You're using Eurocentric lens. You're using Eurocentric city as a foundation. I remember taking classes with you, um, you know, at Howard University, where you know all of the, you know, McLuhan and all of the great scholars. They were all dead white men. You know, today theory and praxis, according to the across the academy, no matter what discipline you're using, are have been written and published and 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 curated by old white men who are mostly dead and the research have not changed or evolved or developed. 
Um, and, you know, Dr. Abdi made a point about using I, you know, ethnography and, and annotated, you know, theory as a way of speaking about scholarly work, you know, to be able to implement those in your research and, and, and be able to um, give it a, a voice and say that's authentic research. So universal right publication, I think right now is my biggest form of activism, as well as being a Fulbright scholar where I, I go, uh, go about and, and teach and work with colleges and universities internationally and bring that into those spaces as well, you know, as well as being a poet and a linguist and an activist in those type of spaces. So I am grateful right now for, for the ability to be able to write and not be afraid. We also know that you know, publishing is becoming even more marginalized to date. You know, you cannot just, a lot of publishers are no longer accepting solicited manuscripts, you know, for monographs. You need an agent in order to do that. So if you're already marginalized and you're, you're in one of the marginalized demographics where they're not validating your voice, now how are you going to be able to afford to pay for an agent to get you a seat or just disability on a publisher's table? Um, and on top of that, you know, not only is it becoming more marginalized, 80% of the scholars who are being published, you know, are, are being minimized. So you don't even have access to marketing and distribution so that your work gets to the demographic that you want it to get to. On top of that, you know, you're also possibly being priced out of the market. So the books that you're publishing, if you do open access or if you do any of those other forms, your books are so expensive that the people who need to read them and see them cannot even afford them. So going back to pulling back the curtains <laughs> and seeing who is behind it. Yes, we need editors. It's a form of activism. Yes, we need as Black scholars to say, no, I cannot do more service work because then I'm not being able to write. And if I can't write, I can't publish. If I can't publish, I don't get tenure. If I don't get tenure, then my job is in jeopardy. But now we're all being, you know, in living in a fear, a, a, a space of fear where this overcast, this shadow, you know, this cloud over us that if we publish and write about Black scholars, if we write about Black studies, you know, nobody's going to listen to us anyway. You know, the fear that our jobs are in jeopardy if we teach about Black studies from an African-centered and Afrocentric point of view. You know, so I encourage everyone to look at, you know, if you look at um, actually Nadab, Dr. Nadab at Temple University, she wrote a book called The Afrocentric School, where she shows you know, historically where Black scholars have been, have created so many things and how to include these things into your, your teaching syllabus and, and your lesson plans. So you can you begin to have a beginning space of how to teach and work from an Afrocentric point of view, because it is going to be important if you're going to allow space for people who are marginalized. It will be important if you're going to be an ally, and it will definitely be important in the in the future because we are in a space of social movement right now, and we are towing the ground, and that is my space of activism right now. Thank you. Okay, we're down to our last four minutes. I'm going to let Dr. Dr. Abby speak because what I'm going to do is this. I, I do, I have like the biggest scholar crush on all of you all right now. All of you all are my scholar crushes at this moment because you all are amazing. Um, I have enjoyed every second of every this discussion today. Thank you all for coming and sharing space and time with us. Your intellect, your intelligence, your work, it's just amazing. It's move, it's moving. Um, and I feel like these students here have been inspired. Those of you that are in the room, yes. Yes, they're all shaking their heads and nodding yes. Um, and it's really nasty here in Arlington today. It is very wet and nasty and cold, but um, they came out today. And so what I wanna do is we're down to our last three minutes. I wanted to give everybody, the, all of our presenters, one minute to do your last wrap up advice to students, what you would give these students as they go forward and they are looking to publish and share. So I'd like for you to just share your last thought. I'm gonna start with Dr. Abdi, go to Dr. O'Hurl, and then finish with Dr. Sakai. Thank you so much. And, and, you know, as far as activism, I think writing is activism, getting your voice out there, and making that space is activism. So every, every piece of this has been activist work, and I appreciate that space. I think for those of you wanting to, to, to have your voices heard, I know I, I saw Wendy's question in, uh, in the chat as well. Uh, you know, it's all about um, 
finding spaces where read read things that you love and find those spaces because uh, those really will give you uh, momentum uh, to be able to to show. I mean, at least you'll showcase spaces that that accept uh, and value that work. Um, but also just writing, just just having it on paper, uh, double, you know, triple, quadruple, uh, going over it, but. Perfection, as as you know, Dr. Gwen said, it's not it's not it's not the end all be all. Even though we still strive for it, um, but just making sure that that your voice has space, uh, finding mentors to to provide that for you, and and if not, really making that space uh, for yourself. You keep uh, pushing. My first publication was in Liminalities, a journal of performance studies, it's an open access journal, and that really showed me how to write academically. It really showed me how to make my story, um, uh, you know, to give it a space that really was valued. And, and you know, it's a decision I still struggle with that my first one was so, uh, it's an open access journal and it's really uh, personal. And, uh, and yet it's still the one I get the most emails about and uh, the most people wanting to connect with me about it, uh, queer Iranians and otherwise really just uh, really want to connect about that piece. Um, and so, Finding alternative spaces, right, um, is also really helpful. And uh, I look forward to reading all of your works one day, hopefully. And I also have an academic crush on all of you. So thank you so much. <laughs> you great, Dr. Hurl. I think we formed a mutual admiration society right here. <laughs> that is lovely. Um, so writing or thinking in the context, particularly of academic publishing, um, the advice I'd leave people with is to, to hit submit, to be the enforcer of your own deadlines, to hit submit, even if you're not sure it's absolutely perfect, um, to, and to do so sort of being open to take some risks, right? That you may do something imperfectly and that that is still really important and valuable. The other thing I would say is, um, I think we often don't celebrate the steps along the way when you finish, like, so I encourage everybody to celebrate when they finish a draft for themselves, to celebrate their first submissions, right? To celebrate their first rejections, right? Because all these rejections are part of the process of writing and publishing and learning. To celebrate when you get helpful feedback. To celebrate when you recognize you've received unhelpful feedback, right? Um, and to be willing to engage in the process um, each step of the way. I think is how how our stories get out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Last word, Dr. Sakai. Huge academic crush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great scholars. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attended. And as far as advice, I mean, I think just to add to what everyone has already said, you know, just go out there and do it. Um, I think perfection is relative. Um, and I think that um, it's all subjective. It's how you see yourself. We all enter spaces and we know what our limits are. We know what we're good at. We know where we need improvement. Um, and we know what that, that pinnacle is that we want to reach. And I really don't believe that there is anything wrong with um, trying to reach those, um, those heights. You know, I mean, it said reach for the, for the moon and land, land among the stars, right? You know, so I really believe that we should always do our best and move forward, you know, and it's also, it's okay to pick yourself up and cry, cry along the way. I mean, it's all part of the process, like my, my colleagues have said here on the call, um, you know, and just do it every day when you get up in the morning, you know, know that today is a moment, today is your moment, you know, to try something new, to do something new, to step out on faith. Because you will, you will thank yourself, your past self, yes, you know, today and say, you know what, I'm glad my past self, you know, pushed that button. I'm glad my past self, self you know, reached out, you know, with that email to uh, somebody that they admire or a scholar they'd like to work with or somebody they would like to review their work or somebody they would like to co-author or publish with them. You know, you will thank yourself in the future for taking the initiative to do that. And anything that comes to your mind, any idea, any thought, validate it. Know that it's worthy to be considered. You know, share it. Talk to your classmates and your colleagues about it. But for, you know, above all, become 
the spaces that you want to see. Write the stories that you want to see that's not written. Become the editors that you wish would read your work. Reach out and join the boards where you see that there's no representation and co-author and become allies of people who are in marginalized spaces. I encourage all of you to also reach out to me. I mean, we have a community space. Dr. Harris has written, you know, in our community forum where we are open to graduate students and scholars who feel that there is a message out there that you want to write and talk about that you cannot write and talk about. And we promote you and we market you and we give you an opportunity to call yourself a published author, even if you're just starting. So as a junior scholar myself, you know, as, you know, um, a great admirer of all of you and all of the scholars who are towing the line today, I encourage you not to give up and to always put your best foot forward. And we finished pretty good on time. We're only four minutes over. I want to thank you all for taking the time out today to join us. On behalf of myself and Dr. Kimberly Meltzer, Mary Mount Satellite Student for the Copenhagen, uh, the Copenhagen Center here at Marymount University, thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you at our next event. Please, uh, we have one every month. Next month, we are excited um, for our next series. So we'll follow our web pages um, to keep updates on all of our programming. Thank you all and you have a great afternoon.